as we continue our work through the gospel according to Luke today, we're going to be reading verses uh, 24 through 45 of Luke chapter 1. We will return to the main corpus of this passage next Sunday also as we focus in in particular on Jesus, the incarnate Son of God by the Virgin Mary. Today, a little more focus on Mary, so I'll give you that heads up as we turn to this scripture. Hear now God's word. After these days, it's the days of the Annunciation to Zechariah and his return home, his wife, Zechariah's wife, Elizabeth, conceived. And for five months, notice that, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Then verse 26, In the sixth month, that does not mean the sixth month of the year, that means the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, see, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid, the maidservant, the, the slave of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, in Elizabeth's womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, and why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. So today, as we prepare to dig into this scripture a bit, uh, go ahead and give you the title of the sermon is Highly Favored. You could also call that Highly Graced. Highly Favored. Uh, amazingly favored, amazingly graced, and it's part of this little sub-series that we're doing in the Gospel according to Luke, chapters 1 and 2. Believe before dawn. God calls us to believe before the sun rises. God calls us to believe even when it's still dark. And today, the, the main takeaway 
We're going to start off with it. We'll close with it. Is this. Grace first. Grace. That's the heavy emphasis in this passage of scripture we just read. Grace comes first. What does Ephesians 2, 8 say? We're saved by grace through faith, right? Grace first. God's choice of Mary was a couple of things in relation to her response. You'll need to fill in those blanks. Is it God's choice of Mary was because she was so good and did the following things, so God picked her out? God's choice of Mary was because he just knew and saw ahead that she was going to be really good, and so he just picked her out based on what he could see ahead since he's omniscient? Is that the way we're going to fill in this blank? Nevertheless, she models New Testament faith. Um, so let's go to the, the first here. God's choice of Mary was before, before Mary's response. In Ephesians, the Apostle Paul tells us everyone who is chosen in Christ was chosen before the foundation of the earth. Let me make this clear. If you're a Christian, God chose you before the foundation of the earth. Mary was chosen before any response she made. And she was chosen beyond any response she made. In other words, there's nothing that she did that gets even close to the same league of the calling that she received from God. You don't stack these things up and say, well, they kind of balance each other out. She doesn't do anything to, to warrant this. So this is grace. This is the message of grace. If you're saved, you're saved by God's grace. It's not based on what you did, what you're going to do, what you may do in the future, what you may do on this earth, what you may do in heaven. It's not based on that. It's based on God's grace. Um, it's beyond her response, before her response. Nevertheless, Mary models, and this is important for us to understand, as Protestants for us to understand, Mary models New Testament faith. She's an introduction of New Testament faith here. In God's supreme grace, all this flows out of grace now, she does something vis-a-vis -vis God's word. And she humbly follows up with something, self-sacrificially serving. So let me explain this. This is not just about Mary. This is about if you are a Christian, if you're called to be a Christian, this applies to you too. So, so what does she do? What does she do with God's word? She puts it on the side and shows it on her coffee table. Is that what she does? No, she believes God's word. And then you could say, well, yeah, she believed it. And then she said, God, that sounds like a great plan. I'm not sure I'm in on this. <laughs> no, she believes God's word and she humbly obeys, self-sacrificially serving. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul says, this is the summary for saved Christians. I urge you, therefore, brothers, in light of God's mercy, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is Mary right here, Romans 12, 1. See, grace is, is sweeping. Grace is not simply, well, I'm a sinner, so God saves me by Jesus coming and dying on the cross. It includes that. If you miss that, you miss, you miss centrally the gospel. However, however, grace is much bigger than simply mercy. Mercy is an avenue, an aspect of grace. But grace includes new creation. Grace includes new possibilities. Grace includes everything that God has planned for you. Grace for Mary centers on a call and a purpose for her life in God's plan. What about you? If you're saved by grace, if Jesus, his death on the cross, brings you salvation, deliverance from sin, why? Why did God do that for you? Why did Jesus die on the cross for you? What's the plan? In the Bible, there's always a plan connected with grace. It was for Mary. What about for you? God's grace is on purpose. Let me make this very clear. God's grace is on purpose. What does his grace mean for you, Christian? What's his plan for you this year, this week? So now we're going to uh, turn to, that's the overview. Now let's go to the scripture 
work our way through at least a little bit of this scripture. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce the concept of step up parallels. In the Bible, not only in Hebrew poetry where you have parallels with the poetic use, you've heard me talk about that a lot before, there's also something that's called narrative parallelism. So you get a story and another story that relate to each other. And Luke uses a lot of narrative parallels, I mean all the time, and he particularly likes a, a specific type of parallelism called step-up parallelism. You need to be aware of step-up parallelism to, to really read the Bible a little bit better, okay? So uh, here's the way it works. You, you get a first story that may be a pretty good story, and then you step up to one that's even better. Do you follow? Okay. That's what step-up parallelism does. Uh, the, the, the first turns out to just be the warm-up act. Have you ever been to a concert where there's a warm-up act that's pretty good and then the big start? Okay, this is what is going on. In particular, to understand Luke chapters 1 and 2, we got this step-up parallelism relating John's story, Jesus' story, over and over again. John's parents, Mary. Annunciation about John, Annunciation about Jesus. Um, John's birth, which is pretty big, but I, I usually don't see tons of people holding candles when we remember John's birthday. But you know what? Christmas is a pretty big deal, right? So you get the idea that we got a step up going on here. And, and Luke just carries this through. John's circumcision and naming, we get that in Luke 1 and 2. Then we get Jesus' circumcision and naming, chapter 1, chapter 2. We get John's boyhood and growing up, some, some serious information about that, which is unique to Luke. And then we find out about Jesus and his boyhood. The only glimpse of Jesus and his boyhood really we get is, is, is from Luke. So Luke, by the inspiration of God, juxtaposes what God juxtaposed in the history. John, who's awesome, but Jesus, who is infinitely <laughs> beyond John. Um, so now, today, of course, we're looking at, last week we looked at the Annunciation to Zechariah about John. Today, we're looking at the Annunciation to Mary about this Jesus who's going to be born. There's one thing about this that hits us, though, and it's part of the gospel. To step up, God's word teaches us, we often are called to step down before we step up. As the Bible says, as for instance, James says, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. And we get this downward movement, just like we got a downward movement of the Son of God from heaven coming down and, you know, to earth in our flesh, okay? We get this call for us in the gospel. So we're supposed to pick up on this. So let's talk about some parallelism. And we start off with some seeming step downs, okay? Um, steps down. So first of all, where do the two annunciations take place? Let's look at that. One we read about is in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the central city in the Bible. Even when we look to the coming age to come, it's the new Jerusalem from heaven, right? Jerusalem is a big deal. How many times is Jerusalem mentioned in the Old Testament? Over 650. And if you go ahead and count in references to Zion, which refer in various ways to Jerusalem or the Temple Mount or this or the actual, you know, hill of Zion, over 800. So, Bible scholars, let me ask you this. You'll remember this. The number of times Nazareth is mentioned in the Old Testament. Start just thinking them up. You know, go through the, the law, the prophets. Come on, come on, come on. Psalms. You guys are remembering all this, right? Nazareth. How many times? Zero. In the entire Old Testament, zero. We get Bethlehem quite a bit. Nazareth is never heard from in the Old Testament, in the entire Hebrew Scriptures. Never heard from in the Mishnah, in the Talmud. Even the political historian from the first century I mentioned last week, Josephus, never mentions Nazareth. Nada. In fact, the, the, the oldest reference we have to Nazareth outside of the New Testament is finally in, I think, 1962 it was, an inscription was found at Caesarea Maritima, Herod's coastal city, uh, referring, but, but that to the divisions, like what I talked about last week with Zechariah, the divisions of the priest, some of them were stationed at Nazareth in the third century AD. 
I mean, this is the best we can do with Nazareth. So we're supposed to pay attention to this. The annunciation from, you know, the Lord in Jerusalem surely is going to outstrip the one over in some town nobody's ever heard of, right? Well, not quite. Okay, let's keep going. We've got uh, the two people uh, receiving these annunciations. We've got the old, upright, righteous, well-respected priest. Okay, that's who he is. He's a priest. And then to fill in the blank, he's a covenant son, a son of the covenant of, the, of God with Israel. So that's as high up as you get. You know, it's high up stuff. Women are not sons of the covenant by definition. I mean, they're under the covenant, but they're not sons of the covenant. So obviously, this man who's a son of the covenant, who, by the way, on top of that is a priest, clearly in the denunciation to him is going to be the topper, right? No, not quite. We have him, but on the other hand, we have a young what? A woman who started all kind of mission work and is now in her 30s, has been so faithful for the last 20 years? No. A young virgin woman. Virgin woman. Surely a teenager. She's betrothed. She's not married yet. Marriage has not been consummated yet. Which I, she's in stage one of being married yet. Is that a step up or a step down? Well, it turns out it's a step up because if you actually know the scripture, lo and behold, you go all the way back to the introduction of the gospel, the gospel of redemption in Genesis 3, verse 15. And what does God say to the serpent? I will put enmity between you and the woman. Wait a minute, that's supposed to be the man, isn't it? No, no, no. God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Between, and I'll dig in on this next Sunday when we talk about Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary. Between your seed and her seed. Everywhere else in the Bible, it's the man's seed. What is going on here with this woman and the seed of the woman? Unless there's going to be no biological man involved. Just a little preview of next week. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Also, Isaiah 7, 14. Spent a lot of time on this with a couple sermons in the summer in July of 2021. You can go back and listen to those. We'll come back to this next week a bit. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin, young woman, who's going to be a virgin, shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Oh, maybe the woman is a step up in this case. First annunciation to Zechariah is where? I mean, the top of the top, right? The golden, gold-plated temple of God, and not just at the temple, but inside the temple in the holy place, where Zechariah is only going to go one time in his entire life. It's his lucky day. He's offering uh, the Tamid altar of incense offering inside the holy place of the golden temple. Right, you know, like the holy of holies is right there, just beyond the veil. Well, surely that's going to be the top annunciation. Because where's the other option? Basically, a small house in a town nobody's ever heard of. That's a few miles off the main highway from Egypt to Damascus. Well, guess what? The little house where Mary is, the, the language there indicates Gabriel comes into her, into the house. And if you've ever been to Na Nazareth before, you know under the Church of Annunciation, for instance, there's all those little bitty humble houses that date back to the time of Jesus. I mean, little houses like you know, <laughs> this size house, like, like he would call it a large closet, right? turns out that's where it happens. As Coleridge brilliantly says, the goal of God's plan is not a place, but a person. So Gabriel's greeting to Zechariah and his greeting to Mary. Let's look at those. Gabriel simply appears on the right side of the altar of incense. Remember, that's on the south side. That's the right side. That's propitious. So that's good. Doesn't say a thing, though. And Zechariah is afraid. 
<laughs> and then he starts talking. He doesn't say, Hail, Zechariah, righteous priest, you've really done well. And he doesn't do any of that, okay? When he assures Zechariah, though, he says, Your prayer has been heard. Elizabeth is going to be our son. And goes on to say, He's going to be the, the prophet who fulfills, you know, Malachi chapter 4. I mean, in, coming as Elijah. It's awesome stuff. Uh, but to Mary, notice this. Gabriel appears and immediately greets her almost reverently. And they're all grace words. Kari, um, grace, greetings. You who are highly favored, and I emphasize that, I like the King James here, because this kakara tomine is perfect participle. That's Perfected in high level favor, highly favored, highly graced. The Lord is with you. Not the Lord may be with you. If you do really well, the Lord's good. the Lord flat out right now is with you. I mean, is with you. And the angel said, "Fear not, Mary, for you found favor." There it is, Karen, Karen, grace. Okay, it's grace all over this passage. Grace all over. Um, with Mary, the sovereign grace of God is simple and unrequested. Notice this. Zechariah is praying the mercy prayer of Israel at the Tamid. Probably earlier in his life, he and Elizabeth prayed numerous, innumerable prayers for a child. Gabriel seems to be responding to one or both of those things. In this case, Mary has not asked for any of this. <laughs> God has decided. It's unmerited and unrequested grace. Um, through the first annunciation, God calls Zechariah to believe and father a miraculous child via a barren woman whose womb is going to be opened in a conception story that has multiple parallels with really some of the high point pivots of the Old Testament. Abraham, Sarah, Isaac. Um, Manoah, his wife, Samson. Hannah, Samuel. That's an awesome story. And, and no question, it's a great tradition. But through the second annunciation, the one to Mary, God calls Mary to believe and to risk everything. I mean, her reputation, possibly her life, be stoned to death, all kinds of stuff. And to give herself as mother in some kind of conception. What are we talking about there? What should we fill in the blanks on that? For the some kind of son. Okay. God's calling Mary to do something that's never been done before. <laughs> this is an unprecedented. It, it, nothing like this, even close to this in the entire Old Testament. In, you know, thousands of years. Unprecedented, unique conception for the, and that's all caps, the unique son. Would you believe if God called you? to do something that's never been done before? Would you give yourself for it? That's what's going on here. Mary's question, her question is different. I talked about this last week. The Greek language is it's, it's very different. I mean, he's saying, according to what am I going to know this? That's what Zechariah says to Gabriel. This time, Mary just says, how, how's this going to happen? I'm a virgin. She's not questioning God. She's asking a simple, basic question. It's different than Zechariah. And, of course, we've already seen Gabriel's dealing with her differently. <laughs> She's I'm sure, a different calling, uh, this virgin young woman. Gabriel's response, totally different. And notice, Gabriel never pulls his name or his rank on Mary. He does when he disciplines Zechariah. I am Gabriel. <laughs> Do you not know who I am? I stand in the presence of God, and I'm delivering a gospel to you that you're not believing. So you're going to be quiet. Until the baby's born. That's G Gabriel never even pulls his name with Mary. Here's how he responds to her. Well, here's how it's going to happen. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One being born will be called Son of God. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. That is the same language that Luke uses later. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when he's quoting Jesus, who, who's preparing his 
disciples for Pentecost. And he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Okay. Well, what about the power overshadowing? The power of the Most High, by the way, that's a reference to one of God's names in the Old Testament. It's El Elyon, God Most High. So that's, that's there. That's the term that is referenced to Melchizedek, the great priest. Um, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. In the transfiguration, after Simon Peter is kind of being a little bit clumsy the way he does, and he's talking too much, and, um, you know, Jesus has transfigured Moses and Elijah there, and Simon Peter says, let's build a tabernacle, one for you, one for, one for Moses, one for Elijah, because y'all are obviously the big three, <laughs> and he's getting it totally wrong. And the glory of God apparently envelops in a cloud Peter, James, and John. So there's that envelop, the same verb there, same verb there. And it, uh, it's um, uh, episkia, okay, um, overshadow. But then also in Psalm 91, verse 4, in the Greek Septuagint, the Lord will cover you with his pinions. He will protect you. He'll be your shield and your buckler. So it means not only to envelop, but also to protect her, to make her safe. And then she gets a sign. Zechariah is asking for a sign. She gets one. And behold, your relative, Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. You get that? Is anything impossible with God? Answer me, folks. No. Everything's possible with God. In your life, too. In our lives. Elizabeth... In some format is the sign. What's the format? She's pregnant now. She was barren. She's a barren old woman. She's pregnant. That's the sign. And then, of course, the truth is nothing will be impossible with God. And that links us back to Abraham and Sarah when the Lord says to Abraham in Genesis, we read this in Genesis chapter 18, verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? This is the question God asked Abraham. And what's the answer to that rhetorical question? No, nothing's too hard for the Lord. So Sarah was going to get pregnant. She's going to have a son. Um, I've talked about Zechariah's response, Mary's response. Here it is. Number one, I am the Lord's maid servant. Let it be to me according to your word. David Garland puts it this way. Mary's humble response of faith basically conveys, I do not know what all this means, but I trust God to do what is good. I don't understand this, but I trust God to do what is good. So she accepts the truth that nothing is impossible with him. And she receives it with humility and submission. This is our call as Christians. Humility and submission. On the humility side, she says, I'm the Lord's doulet. I'm his, his maidservant slave girl. He can do what, me, what, what he wants. And it also takes us back to the covenant promise that God gives to, to David. Right in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 18. Notice how David responds. Then King David went in. This is the covenant that Jesus is going to fulfill now, the eternal kingdom. Then David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me thus far? That's the way we all, if we're saved Christians, we all let us say that to God all the time. And then notice this submission. Let it be to me according to your word. Hey, have you ever prayed this before? Your will be done. Ever prayed that? Anybody ever heard those words before? Here it is. The Lord's prayer before the Lord's prayer, right? May it be to me according to your word. Thy kingdom come, your will be done in my life. Um, 17th century Scottish Highland preacher. There were some good ones in the 1600s in the Scott Highlands. You know that, right? Thomas Hogg said this. Submission is is preferable to comforting consolation. We want comforting consolation, right? But Hogg says, because consolation pleases us, but submission pleases God. Consolation pleases us. Submission pleases God. And that's what Mary's response is like. She trusts the conception and the protection. And let me be very clear about this. This is out of the ordinary totally. 
A virgin betrothed teenage girl is not supposed to travel on her own from Upper Galilee to the Judean hills. This is just not done. She doesn't have a bodyguard. We're not told that she has any retinue going with her. She's a poor girl. She is risking everything. She's supposed to stay secluded until she's married. She's a virgin. She's going to get married. But you know what? She totally believes the conception, and apparently it must have happened very quickly. Let's put it that way, because she goes in haste during the sixth month. Remember, the Annunciation is during the sixth month. During the sixth month, and, and like early in the sixth month, because she's going to stay with Elizabeth for three months, and John hasn't been born yet, and then she leaves Elizabeth apparently shortly before John is born. So ladies, you'll understand this, right? She does not wait a month or a little bit more than, than a month to find out if she's pregnant or not. Do you hear what I'm saying? She goes immediately, immediately in haste. And God apparently is her shield. God is her protection. He will, you know, provide for her. The power of the Most High will overshadow her. And she makes it to Elizabeth. I mean, that, that's faith. That's trust. She trusts the conception and the protection of the Lord going quickly. And uh, God's choice of Mary, now back to this was before and beyond her response. She is the recipient of unmerited and unrequested grace, but nevertheless, she models New Testament faith, right? She, she believes God's word and she obeys it. She, she acts upon it. As Elizabeth says, blessed are you among women, blessed is the child you will bear, and why is this granted to me? The mother, my Lord, has come to me. For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who does what? believed that there would be a what? Y'all know this word from a few sermons ago. Fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. So, are we called to worship Mary, Mary's body, something like that? No, no, no. In Luke, same gospel, in Luke 11, 27, 28, we read this. As he, Jesus, said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you. And the breast at which you nursed, she says this to Jesus. How does Jesus reply? Blessed are those who, what, with the word? Blessed, rather, are those, Jesus says, who hear the word of God and keep it. And keep it. Like, protect it and live it out. In Luke eight twenty, and he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But Jesus answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. That's the answer. But here's the reality. Mary is one of those disciples. In Acts 1, 14, we read this as they're waiting for Pentecost. All these were with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus. She's there waiting for the spirit to come upon her again at Pentecost. Isn't that awesome? So now a prayer. Let's work out this prayer. I'll give it to you. You can fill in the blanks, take it home and pray it too. Father, I rejoice that your grace for me was eternally something and beyond any merit or faithfulness on my part, past, present, or future. Anything I did in the past, anything I'm doing now, anything I will do forever. Please give me some kind of heart to do something with your word and to follow up with something. What are the answers? I'll go ahead and give them to you. Father, I rejoice that your grace for me was eternally before and beyond any merit or faithfulness on my part, past, present, or future. Please give me a humble, trusting heart to hear, or you could put in there, believe. That's what hearing means, like actually, not one in or out the other, I should believe it your word, and to do it, to keep it, to keep it. It's one thing to say, oh yeah, I believe all that stuff. I said it in church. It's another thing to live it and put yourself on the line for it, to keep it. May your will be done in me, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray together. You pray along with me. Father, I rejoice that your grace for me was eternally before and beyond any merit or faithfulness on my part, past, present, future. Please give me a humble, trusting heart 
to hear, to believe your word, and to keep it. May your will be done in me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.